Uh, we are going to be continuing on in the uh, couples of the Bible study. Uh, this week we are going to be in uh, talking about King Xerxes and Queen Esther uh, in the book of Esther. Uh, found kind of near the, the middle here, just a little bit uh, off from, uh, from Psalms. And uh, this, this whole story, so if you have a chance uh, to read this uh, this week or whatever, it's a short book. But there's a lot that we're not going to be able to, to cover tonight. Right. Uh, we're right. going to kind of hit the main points of, about this couple and some of the things that God teaches us through them. But uh, there, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here. And so uh, you take, take some time and check it out. Yeah. Uh, you might see in some of your Bibles, uh, I'm going to butcher this so you know me. Uh, <laughs> king Xerxes was the king's name, king in Persia uh, that we're talking about here. You may see him called King Ahasuerus. Yes, he did, did it. it. Did I do he it? did it. Right. Yeah. King yeah, Ahasuerus. So you might see that mm-hmm. in your Bibles as we're talking about this. Uh, Hebrew, Greek names, different names uh, uh, used mm-hmm. here, but the same guy. Uh, and then Queen Esther is the, the wife that we'll be talking about here. Today. So this, this book is kind of like an action movie. Uh, there's, a, yeah. there's a kind of a rags to riches story of this you know, yeah. woman who, who raises, rises up to become queen. Uh, you have the, the, the evil villain you know, plotting to wreck everything along the way. Yeah. Uh, you have this kind of climax where everything changes and, and, and there's a turn of events that you could never expect, of course, right? Uh, right. And then you have at the end God's plan... Uh, and, and justice being served and, and God's plan prevailing. So uh, we're going to kind of dig through and uh, see, see what God has for us. So That's on. right. Um, what is so fascinating about the book of Esther is that there are actually no references to God in this book. But just like every book in the Bible, God is the main character, right? It's always about God. It's not about us. But there's a few verses in the Bible that state that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us that the Holy Scriptures, that they make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That his word will thoroughly equip us for every good work. And isn't that why you're all here tonight? That we can be equipped for every good work, especially the work that we are called to do in our marriages. So there's some key people in the book of Esther. The first one is the Persian king, King Xerxes. And then he has a first queen. Her name is Vashti. And then we have Queen Esther, we have Mordecai, who's actually Esther's cousin, and then we have the villain, Haman, which he just so happens to be King Xerxes' right-hand man. Very ironic. Um, so the book of Esther, it begins with King Xerxes. He's throwing a big banquet for himself, all his nobles, all his officials. The Bible says that this party lasts for 180 days. Can you imagine a, a six-month <laughs> six long party? And that this banquet, the Bible says that it was thrown to display King Xerxes' vast wealth, his splendor, and all of his glory. So it's all about King Xerxes, right? And then after that party, he threw a seven-day feast for the city of Susa. Susa was the capital of Persia, the city, the capital of Persia. So he invited everybody in the city of Susa to attend this party. And the Bible was very clear about this party. It said that the royal wine was abundant. It actually said that Xerxes commanded that each guest was allowed to drink without restrictions and that the servants were to give each man whatever he wished. So this, is, this must have been even a more wild party. And then meanwhile, Queen Vashti, she's not at the party. She's at a party of her own. She's actually with the noble women. Well, on the seventh day of this party, King Xerxes has it in his mind that he's going to get Queen Vashti to come and parade her around in all of her beauty. She was beautiful. So he sends his noblemen to go get Vashti from this party, and he wants to parade her around, right? So the noblemen go, they tell Vashti, get your royal crown on, get your royal robes on, and Vashti says, no. No. No, she's not having any part of that. No, no. she's not going to do it. No. So the king no. wants to, to, to take his queen, take his wife, he wants to parade her around in front of everyone else, uh, and he's, they're all drunk, you know. They're, they're, I mean, yeah. command you go to a party, and the, the command is drink <laughs> as much as you possibly can, and tell the servants to give them you know more until they can't drink anymore. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the kind of the, the kind of thing that's going on here. Calls his wife out. Hey, I want to parade my, my beautiful wife around, show another thing that I own that's so great in front of everyone. And she says, No, I'm not having any part of that. So this can't be. This can't be. We can't allow this. So the king and all his, his good buddies, you know, these noblemen around him, they're giving him this great counsel. They say, you can't, let your, you can't let her say no to you like this. You can't let her do this. 
You know, what if, what if the other husband or the other wives get word of this, you know, then they're going to start all treating us this way and saying all these, you can't, this, you can't have this. So the king gets very upset at this. And he, and he kicks Queen Vashti to the curb. He, he, ba- he banishes her. He says, you're no longer queen. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. And he's listening to all this, this awful counsel around him. And not only that, not only does he, he get rid of his queen, he gets rid of his wife, basically divorces her in, in the, the king and queen way, whatever that is. He banishes her from the king to the palace, you know. But he also, he makes an edict or a law, and he says, hey, all of you wives out there in the kingdom, it is now a law that you must honor and respect your husbands because we don't want anything like this going on around here again. So, you know, as, as King Xerxes here, he comes on the scene of this, 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 uh, uh, this account of, of what's going on here, and we, we automatically see he's kind of foolish. Uh, he's very prideful. It's everything's about him. Mm-hmm. And so we can kind of look at him in just this one scene, and we're going to see more of this, uh, of some of the bad kind of uh, attributes that he has. One of them is that he has surrounded himself with very poor counsel. How many of us have surrounded ourselves with very poor counsel? When we get into arguments or trouble in our marriage and t- go through hard times, and then we call on our friends, we call on our mom and dad, we call on brother and sister, we call on somebody, and we say, can you believe my wife did this and she did that? And guess what they're going to say? You, I can't believe she did that. Leave her. Get her out. You know, you can't let her treat her that. You can't. You know, same, same thing goes for the reverse. You know, look at my husband. Did he did all these things to me. Guess what they're going to say to you? They're going to give you bad counsel. Unless you've got some good Christian brothers and sisters around you that can give you some counsel from God's word that's real and actually will help you. But in, in many times we surround ourselves with bad counsel. And that is certainly what King Xerxes did, surround himself with bad counsel. Proverbs 13 uh, chapter 13, verse 20 says this, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Uh, the saying is, you, you run with dogs, you get yeah. fleas, right? That's the, yeah. We tell our kids I, that. We always remember that. <laughs> uh, it's important to remember the, the counsel that you seek, uh, especially in your marriage. Especially in your marriage. Seek mm-hmm. good counsel. Uh, we also see that King Xerxes has surrounded himself with a lot of drunkenness. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, I had a glass of wine on New Year's Eve or something. I'm talking about, you know, the wine is overflowing and I command you to drink as much as possible. That's the kind of drunkenness that's going on. So he's invited this into his household. If you, we, if anybody, when you invite drunkenness into your life, over drinking, indulging in drunkenness, when you invite that into your marriage, when you invite that into your life, there there is nothing good that will come of it. It might seem okay at first, it might seem okay for a while, but at some point, it will ruin things in your life, in your marriage. The Bible talks extensively about this. When we're drunk, it actually, it it, it subdues the voice of God and it allows sin to flow freely from our our lives. It just, it causes trouble. Uh, Many of you out there can attest to that uh, and understand it. I can certainly in my own life. So we need to refrain from this kind of behavior. In verse, uh, cha- sorry, Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray, uh, sorry, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Uh, don't, don't let yourself fall into that. And the other thing that King Xerxes displays for us here is that he is very prideful, arrogant, and he wants to lord his position mm-hmm. over his wife. And we see this coming into... <laughs> play when sin enters the very first marriage through Adam and Eve. We talk about this a lot. In Genesis 3.16, God says that the wife will have uh, the, uh, uh, she's going to want to take the, the husband's position from him and be the, the spiritual leader, and the husband is going to try to lord that position over his wife. And you have this sinful yeah. battle that, is, that, is, that we're prone to in our marriages, and, and that's not uh, what God has called us to and not what he wants from us. And so uh, another example that Xerxes has given us of not what not to do what as not a husband. To do. So the story continues on here. So King Xerxes is now uh, issued this edict, and he is now without a queen. That's right. He's alone. He has no queen. So his personal attendants, some great advisors, they come up with a great idea for him to find a new queen. They actually suggest that the king, he issues an edict to bring all of the beautiful young virgins in the entire kingdom to the palace to receive 12 months of beauty treatments, to spend the night with King Xerxes, and to see if they, he, he meets them with, you know, if he can select them as his new queen, if they please the king, it says. So Xerxes, of course, he says, this is a great idea. 
So he, he issues this edict to bring all the women to the palace. And this is where we find Queen Esther. Well, she's not the queen yet. We meet Esther. She was an orphan Jew living in the city of Susa, and she was raised by her cousin named Mordecai. He um, took her in as his own, and she falls under this edict, and she is moved to the palace. And she has to receive these 12 months of beauty treatment, so Mordecai tells her not to tell anyone that she was a Jew. And Esther listens. So Esther, when she's placed in the palace, she's actually found with favor by the guard that's overseeing this, these women. And here's where we really begin to see God's direction and sovereignty in the life of Esther. I'm reminded of Joseph back in Genesis, if any of you know that story, when he was sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers. But the Bible says that he wasn't brought to Egypt to be a slave, but that God would use Joseph in his sovereign plan to save many lives. And we're going to see this play out in Esther's life. So when Esther, she was brought before the king after her 12 months of beauty treatments. That's a long time to do that. <laughs> That's a long time. The Bible says that he loved Esther more than all the other women. So he set the royal crown on her head and he made Esther his queen. And he gave another great banquet. This guy loves parties, right? Girl party. To celebrate his new queen. And he even proclaimed a holiday in her honor. And this reminds me of God's sovereignty in my own life. Out of all the other people in the world, Todd and I, we fell in love, right? And we picked one another over everybody else. And you and your husband, wives, you've done the same. The Bible says that in our hearts a man plans his ways, but it is the Lord that directs our steps. And when you all made vows to one another, God was there. And the Bible says that it is God that joins us together in marriage. And I'm sure you had a celebration of your own on your wedding day. So this was a very joyous occasion for Xerxes, and he loved Esther. Hopefully the celebration didn't look exactly like <laughs> right. Xerxes' celebration, but right. yes. Uh, so we have now Queen Esther. She's, she's been made the queen. King Xerxes has, yeah. has found this beautiful woman and accepted mm -hmm. her into, in, as, as his wife, as his queen. And, uh, and here we have uh, uh, the next character in our story that will be introduced. His name is Haman. Uh, Haman is the King Xerxes' right-hand man. He has appointed Haman to be above all of the other nobles. So he said, you're, you're, uh, you're my right-hand guy, okay? And Haman... Uh, and Mordecai, if you remember, Mordecai was the, the cousin of Esther and the guy mm -hmm. that had kind of raised Esther up, so he's family. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. They have this, this history going on. Haman hates the Jews. It's a, it's a long history of the tribes that they've come from. It goes on generations that they, their families hate each other. It's like the, the family feud. You know, these guys just have hated each other forever. So Haman, he hates the Jews. And he cannot believe that this guy, Mordecai, is not going to honor him, not going to bow down to him, not going to listen to him. He just says he refuses. So this makes Haman extremely upset. And he wants to kill him. But not only does he want to just kill mm -hmm. Mordecai, he says, you know what I want to do? I want to, I want to kill mm -hmm. all the Jews. I want to kill all the Jews that are living here. And, and he uh, tries to find a way to do that. So what he does is he comes up with this plan to, uh, to actually go to the king and try to convince him yeah. that these guys all need to be killed. And so what does he do? So he actually convinces the king to issue this edict to have every Jew destroyed in the land. And when Haman went to the king, he didn't even give him a good reason. He just said, there's some people out there, they're different, they follow different laws, we shouldn't tolerate them. I mean, this is just another example of how Xerxes just is not following good counsel, right? And what's so evil about Haman's plan is that this edict to destroy the Jews, it was not even going to be put into motion for 10 more months. So these poor people had to just live with this death sentence just hanging over their heads. So Mordecai, he's a Jew living in the city of Susa. He immediately sends Esther this message to the palace and he gives her a copy of the decree telling her that she should plead with her king on her people's behalf. But now Esther, she sends back a message to Mordecai, and she's telling him about all the reasons why this is completely impossible for her to do. She reminds him that there's a law in place, that if she even goes to the king without being summoned, that the punishment is death. The king can hold out his gold scepter, but that's only if she's found with favor. And she tells Mordecai, I haven't even seen my husband in 30 days. He hasn't even summoned me. So I'm just thinking to myself, and ladies, don't we do this? 
We give ourselves excuses about why it's too risky to follow something that God's called us to do. I, I can reason myself I would be an endurer of the word. I start to count the costs, and then I just reason myself right out of obedience. I definitely do that. But, you know, in the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus says that his sheep listen to him and that they follow him. And I'm sure Esther was also very comfortable in her palace. She was protected, right? She was protected from this edict, or so she thought. She was surrounded by servants. So why was this her problem? Well, if we open up our Bibles to the book of James, verse 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 17, it says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So Esther, you know, she's writing this letter back to Mordecai saying, I'm not going to go in and, and do anything about this. It's not my problem. I'm, I'm happy up here. I got everything I need. She's in the palace. You know, she's queen now. So why, why risk that? Why screw that mm -hmm. up, right? So Mordecai writes this letter back to her. And he says this. And uh, we're in Esther now. Brings us to Esther uh, chapter 4, verse 14, is where we're going to kind of uh, actually read in here a few verses. He says this. For if you keep silent, at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai says, you need to do something. God is calling you to do something. How do you know that he hasn't put you right here in this position just for this reason, just for this purpose, to save God's people? God has a plan and it's going to happen whether you want to be part of it or not. God is sovereign over all of it. In uh, Colossians 1.16, flipping ahead here a little bit, uh, I'll just read this for us. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him. It's all his his plan is going to prevail. Don't you want to be used by him? Maybe God has put you in the job that you're in, in the position that you're in, with a family member that you have, right here, right now, wherever it is in your life, surrounded by people who need to hear about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Because there's an edict right now on all the people around us, and they are being sentenced to a death. And we have the ability to step up in our lives and share the hope and love of Jesus Christ with them and save them from that death. Just like Esther had the same opportunity to save her people. You have the same opportunity to save those around you by sharing what Jesus did for you, by sharing the fact that we are sinners separated by God, destined to go to hell without the saving grace and blood of Jesus Christ sharing that message with those people around you. And Esther was certainly placed there to do this. And finally, she says, what? So after she receives this movie message back from her cousin, she decides to actually listen to his wise counsel. She makes her decision, and she sends this message back to him. And we find it in Esther verse, chapter 4, verse 16. She tells him, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And in her famous line, she says, and if I perish, I perish. See, this is a turning point for Esther. She's decided, she's decided to step out and to risk her life to save her people. And then in the next intense moment, Esther gets dressed up in her royal robes. She stands before the queen's the king's throne, and the Bible says that she won the favor of King Xerxes and that he held out that gold scepter to her. And not only did he hold out that gold scepter to her, sparing her life, he asked her just the sweetest thing. He says, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. King Xerxes, he obviously trusted that if Esther was going to come to him and risk her life, that this was something important. And then Esther draws it out a little bit. Instead of telling him the real reason why she was there, she invited the king and Haman to a banquet the very next day. This reminds me of the verse Proverbs 31 verses, I'm sorry, chapter 31 verses 11 through 12. It says, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. 
She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Wives, we should always try to strive to be someone that our husbands can trust. And what really stands out to me isn't what Esther said, it's what she didn't say. The moment that she was allowed to speak to her husband, she wasn't yelling, she wasn't blaming him, she wasn't, you know, screaming at him about this edict that he issued to annihilate her people. She was respectful and she was extremely patient. And she even prayed for three days before she approached him. This was very convicting to me. I actually had to ask myself, am I constantly crying out to my husband, like crying wolf to my husband, complaining about every little thing that happens to me? I certainly don't have this big issue to go to my husband about. But am I taking some things to the Lord first and casting my cares on him? I don't think my husband is designed to bear all of my burdens the way that God is. And can my husband trust that I've got things handled in an orderly way because I put God first and I let him order my next steps? This reminds me of a smoke detector that we had in an old house. And, you know, smoke detectors are really important. They're loud sound. It can save lives. But we had this really bad habit of when the battery got low, the beeping went off and just it kept beeping and we'll beeping. And, yeah, we didn't change it right away. And that noise, it actually, we forgot, we forgot it was beeping. We just drowned it out. We ignored it, right? I don't want my husband to tune me out because I'm like that constant dripping noise that the book of Proverbs warns us wives not to do. So Queen Esther had found favor with King Xerxes, gained an audience with him, and had the opportunity to expose this plot that Haman wanted to kill all the Jews. Mm -hmm. She goes to him, and he listens to her. She says, we want to have these banquets, and she, she you know, takes her time, and she sets the stage, and then she confronts you know, Haman and, and to King Xerxes and says, hey, this guy is planning to do all these things. He's, he's planning to kill all the Jews. He hates them. He's, you know, this is all his selfish thing. And King Xerxes listens to her and he kills Haman. He executes him and he saves, you know, ch changes this, the whole course of, yeah. of this whole plot. So the Jews were under this edict. It was like 10 months, right? That they were, you know, mm -hmm. they were going to be all killed. You know, he said, kill all the Jews in 10 months. Now the king can't reverse that. Once, once a law has been put in place, it's kind of like in our country, it's a lot harder, it's a lot easier to make a law than it is to take one back, right? So he had this law out there, he couldn't take it back. So what he does, and only a way that God could put this all together, is he makes a new edict, and he says, on this day that all the Jews are supposed to be killed, instead, I want all the Jewish people here to band all together, and I want this in order that they all fight back together, and that they all fight against this, this uh, injustice, they all fight against this. And so they do, they band together on this day and they fight against this edict and they, they actually conquer all their enemies in the land. It's like this, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing, I guess, but it's a great thing for them. You know, they, they go through un, unscathed, they, they aren't exterminated from the land and uh, this whole plan is reversed because of the boldness of Queen mm -hmm. Esther to go forward and stand up for what God had called her to do and asked her to do. And you ask ourselves, are, are we that bold? in our lives to do what God has called us to do. And so this is where we, where we kind of leave off with this story. King Xerxes, we see an example here. Uh, we talked about good examples and bad examples of, <laughs> of couples in the Bible. This is a, yeah. an example of a man who followed uh, some bad counsel. Don't surround yourself with bad counsel. Surround yourself, especially when it comes to marital things. You know, if you want to go to the you guy down the street for, you know, what kind of grass seed to get, that's fine. But when you're asking, you know, counsel about, about your marriage, seek godly advice. Seek real truth. Uh, King Xerxes did, did not do that. Surround himself with fools uh, and a lot of drinking. Uh, make sure that in your life, if this is something that you have struggled with, that it is something that you need to, to give to the Lord. It's something that, it, that can certainly bring to, uh, to ruin a lot of things around you. Right. Uh, and it's something that you want to be very careful with uh, and, and, uh, and pray to God that uh, maybe you, that will be something that you can, can let go. Uh, King Xerxes also lorded his authority over his wife, we talked about. Um, and and this, can be, this can happen in marriage. Well, I said this. I want it this way. I, and that is not the sacrificial leaders that God has called us to be. In Ephesians 5, it tells us that we are to put, as Jesus sacrificed for all of us, we are to lead our homes by sacrificing ourselves for our wives. 
And it's something that we always need to remember. It's this equal, mutual, sacrificial uh, relationship that we have for one another that God has put in place. And it is a great way to live when you're truly living that out uh, in your marriage. So. That's right. And, and Queen Esther, she was such a great example of someone that listened to wise counsel. She was respectful and she lear- earned the love and trust of her husband. Um, and then she also risked the comforts of her palace and her life for the saving of many people. And let's not forget the main character of, the, of this story, who is God, and how his plan prevailed to save his people. That's right. Yeah. It's a pretty cool book. Uh, if you get a chance to read through it on your Definitely. own, it's like, I, like we said, it's short, it's easy read. You can read it in, in, in not mm-hmm. too long. Um, and yeah. uh, there's lots more to get out of this. God That's has a good. lot for us through his word. And it's uh, couples like this, or many more that we're going to look at, that can uh, kind of show us yeah. some good things and some bad things that we should mimic or stay away from <laughs> in our marriage. 180 day ragers, stay away <laughs> from those in your, in your marriage. It's a good, no. uh, bad idea. So, Uh, We're going to take a moment in prayer, and then uh, we'll break into our small groups and uh, have some time of fellowship and dig a little bit deeper into uh, the Word tonight. So uh, let's just take a minute and pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we are uh, blessed and thankful to be here tonight, to be healthy enough to be here, and uh, just able to meet here, Lord. We are so thankful that we are able to to just uh, come together tonight and open your Word together. Uh, The story of uh, King Xerxes and Queen Esther, uh, we are thankful that... uh, uh, that you speak to us through these couples, through these, these uh, examples of to do and what not to do and what happens, Lord. And we're so thankful for your truth that when we need counsel, Lord, that we can seek it. We can seek it from your word and we can seek it from you. And when we are in a tough spot, Lord, we can seek you before anyone else. Lord, I'm thankful that, uh, I'm just thankful to be here tonight, Lord. And I'm thankful that uh, uh, we are able to fellowship with one another. I ask that you go before uh, the small groups, the small group leaders, and this time of, uh, of fellowship and learning uh, and encouraging. Uh, I ask that you be with um, Ashley and Jackson. I ask that you be with their marriage, and I thank you so much for their testimony of, of, of hope and of your saving grace that they were able to share with us tonight. Lord, please bless this evening, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.